Hey, what's up, viewers? This is Josh from Bright Mediums, and welcome to another episode of Beginning iPhone Programming. Today, we're going to build on the Table View app we started in the last episode. So if you haven't seen that yet, go give it a gander so you can catch up. If you don't want to do that, no hard feelings. You can download the code from brightmediums.com forward slash videos and follow along. Today, we're building a model for our Elements app. iPhone apps have three types of components, models, views, and controllers. Models store and retrieve data, define business logic, and manage application state. But most importantly, they conceptualize something in real life, like an element in our app. Views are in charge of visualizing data, displaying controls and input elements, and should remain as dumb as possible, leaving logic tasks to others. Controllers are the bridge between views and models. They receive user actions, interface with models, and update views accordingly. In our Elements app, we don't yet have a proper model. All our data is stored in generic types called dictionaries, and today we're going to change that. OK, let's get started and drop right into the source code. Let's add a new class. Right-click here, New File, Cocoa Touch Class. Call it Element, and make sure it's an NS object. We're going to add a few properties, also known as variables. Var symbol is a string. Var name is a string. Var weight is also a string. At the end of this episode, we'll change this to a proper number, but for now, a string is fine. You might see an error complaining that we need an initializer, so let's create one. An initializer starts with init, and you pass in the required property values, so it should look pretty straightforward. We will assign symbol to symbol, name to name, and weight to weight. Notice the properties on the left side start with self dot. Those point to the properties above. The arguments in parentheses might be named the same, but they are different. They represent constants we then assign to the properties. We will also add a method that will return all the elements. Currently, our data is hard-coded in the view controller, but data retrieval is a better task for a model than a controller, so we'll move it here. But before we do that, we need a method to fetch the data. So let's add a function here called getAllElements. This is the syntax to declare that it returns an array of objects that are instances of the element class. Before we go any further, let's take a closer look at what that static keyword means. I'm going to jump in a playground real quick and create a simplified version of our element class. I'll define two functions named hello. One will be marked static and the other will not. Let's look at the different ways you call these functions. First, the static or class function is simply element with a capital E dot hello. Here, there's no instance object of the element class. We're simply calling the function directly on the class. And you can see that it prints hello from the class element in the console. Second, let e equal element. Here we are creating an instance object from the element class, and then we call the hello function on the instance object. You'll see here that it prints hello from instance object and then a description of the element object. Back to the main code base. Here, let's put the return value so we don't forget, and it'll be an empty array for now. Let's use this opportunity to practice using our initializer above by creating an element using the properties of hydrogen. You'll notice that Xcode auto completes the initializer for me. Symbol is H, hydrogen is the name, and the weight is 1.008. And we could return this element inside an array to satisfy the expectations of this function's declaration. Remember, this function says it returns an array of elements. Let's compare this to the existing dictionary from last episode. It looks quite similar, doesn't it? What we've done by using a model is make the data more foolproof. Let's go into the elements table view controller and cut out the data, leaving the elements property where it is. But let's change it to an array of elements and mark it as mandatory using the exclamation point. When we do that, we tell the compiler that we are responsible for making sure this view controller has data for that property. Now go back to element model, and we will create a static or class property to hold the data. Static let element attributes equal open bracket for our array and paste the data. 
This needs to be a static or class property in order for it to be accessible from within the getAllElements function, which is a class function. Now let's go back to the controller and configure it to get all the elements with that class function. We will do that here in view did load. Delete this. Self.elements, remember this corresponds to the property above, equals capital element dot get all elements. That's it. Now the element property has whatever we are returning from the model. Now that we've changed the data type of the elements property, the data being passed to the table view cell is broken. So let's go into the cell class and fix that. As a shortcut, I will highlight element and command click to jump straight into the cell class where the element property is defined. Let's change the type from a dictionary to an element. Use the exclamation point again to take responsibility over setting that property. If we don't use the exclamation point, the compiler will force us to make an initializer. The reason we don't want that is that the cell is initialized from the storyboard. In the did set observer, change each line to pull the element object's property values rather than the dictionary syntax. Now we haven't actually implemented the get all elements function back in the element class. It's only returning one hard coded element now, but we wanted to pull the data from the dictionaries. To do that, we'll need to iterate over all the dictionaries below and create an element object for each. This is how we do that. First, create an empty array to hold the elements we will create. Second, Use a for loop to loop over the element attributes array. Using the let keyword, create a constant for each new element, and we'll use our good old element initializer, passing in the values from the dictionaries. Third, append each created element to the all array and return all. Now whatever calls this function will get all the elements as element objects. Let's save and run this to check on our progress. Great, it looks exactly the same, which is a success. Let's look at another, more elegant way to implement the getAllElements function. What we did here is so common that Swift has provided a better way to do it, one with a lot less scaffolding. Let's copy this line where we create the element, but not the let constant, and then delete the rest of the function. We're going to implement the entire function in just one line, so we'll start with the return keyword and then element attributes dot map. Map is another iterator like four, but slightly more powerful. Map provides what is called a closure. It's a code block that expects a return value itself. We'll specify the local variable name called attributes. Start with the return again. This is not returning for the function, just for the closure. And now paste in the line we copied from the original implementation. As long as the variable names match, it will work exactly the same. Let's build and run and check it out. Looks okay to me. At the beginning of the episode, I mentioned we would change the weight property to a proper number. In this app, we aren't actually doing anything with the weight property yet, other than displaying it, so it would be fine to leave it as a string. However, in any real use case of this data, we would likely want to do something with this number at some point, and having that value stored as a string is going to severely limit what we can do with it. We will change it to an NS number, which will give us loads of flexibility in the future. Once we change that property type here, we will need to update other sections of the code base to accommodate this new type. First, we need to update the initializer. This is an NS number. We have one error here in get all elements, where we initialize element objects. We need to change the string value from the dictionary data to an NS number, like this hard-coded one here. To start, let's convert our string to a double. A double is a primitive number type, not quite as flexible as an NS number. This is how we convert a string to a double. We first have to cast the string value from the dictionary to an NS string, which gives us a helpful instance method double value that we can use directly on the NS string. Then we create the NS number object like this by passing the double in the initializer. Now let's just pass the new weight number to the element initializer. The next thing we need to do is update the way the data is displayed in the cell. We can't directly assign the weight number to the label text like we can with a string. Instead, we need to convert the NS number back to a string. To do that, we use a helper class called number formatter. Create an instance of number formatter here. Then below, we will use its string method, passing the element weight, to convert it to a string. Let's run this and see what we have. As you can see, we have the number displaying now, but it's only displaying the integer value. 
To fix this, we can set the number formatter number style to decimal. And let's run it again and see if that did it. It does, but now we have a couple outliers. Neon and sodium are only showing two digits, but the others are showing three. This isn't really a problem, but if we want to be consistent, we can set the minimum fraction digits like this. Now we'll run it again, and now it looks exactly like it should. Here's a minor pet peeve of mine. When a row is selected, it remains selected until another one is. Let's fix that by quickly adding a did select row function to the elements table view controller. Type did select and Xcode should autocomplete for you. In the function, we will tell the table view to deselect the row that was selected using the index path provided. Xcode forgot the override keyword again, so add that. It's as simple as that. Let's run it one last time. Select a row and it's deselected automatically. That's it for today. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, feel free to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel. Thanks for watching and see you next time.